here we go. One more video podcast for this year. And I got nothing to say. Honestly, I finished most of my stuff um, two days ago. I spent yesterday doing last minute paperwork and last minute Christmas related stuff. You know what I did last night? What'd you do last night? Video games. <laughs> Good for you. Oh, that reminds me. I've got to sign that paperwork, don't I? Uh, yeah. Okay. Let me do, I'll do that after. Right yeah, after you do. do. <laughs> yep. Okay. Sorry. That's an important one. Um, yep. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Yep. I'm terrible at paperwork. I'm the worst. I think every, everyone else in the loop though has adapted to this. So we've got it down to you. Needing <laughs> Sorry. To you, 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 it's basically the workarounds are so perfect that they all come together at one place, which requires you to initial one document. And then, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. The, the, the line will completely run itself otherwise. And then it's like in December, we have to get Jen to initial this. <laughs> and if you don't, everything blows up. So sorry. You know, the real answer here is you have to start giving me more actual responsibility. Because if, if you give me the, the, the leash to be lazy, I will be. So like, you need to start deferring more shit to me, Matt. You do too much of the actual back end of this stuff. Uh, I've, I've always said the reason I'm a workaholic is because if, if I'm not doing something, the bad thoughts come back. So, oh, well, you know, they've got drugs for that now. Highly recommend building business is my drug. <laughs> I, I mean, all kidding aside, how many successful people out there, historically speaking, men, but now we'll be inclusive people, uh, were just running away from their emotional problems when they built corporations. This is this is why we have toxic masculinity. It's very, very functional in a capitalistic society. This is great. Well, I can't deal with my feelings, so I'll go build a bridge. <laughs> 300 years later, the bridge will be considered iconic for this city. And it's all because the guy built it because he didn't like, you know, didn't he, he was he was fighting with his wife or something. Yeah, yeah totally. Um, okay, so I'll do that right after. And also, I am serious. You really do like not give me enough work here I like, just, i'm i'm perfectly happy with you taking lead and delegating but my dude do delegate i just get up you know honestly all i do is i get up in the morning i like get the dog fed get the kids fed get the kids to school come back sit down start working and then at a certain point in the day all the work is done and like and then and then you know and then i go watch hockey like it's 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 a good life it's a good life. Okay, I'll I will sign that. I also have forgotten to pay for my uh, cell phone for the last two months, so I should probably do that before that gets cut off too. When the pandemic was hitting, it's funny. I had always had the attitude that I never wanted to be signed up to directly pay for anything. I always wanted to be in the loop paying for stuff because I never I don't trust like yeah. companies, the banks. <clears throat> the pandemic came. I said fuck it, and I set up <laughs> everything to auto pay. Because I wasn't sure if the banks would be stable. Oh, that's a good idea. Like I did, like I didn't. I'm like, what if I run out of checks and I can't get checks? Like, what what, what do I do? So one of the things I did in February of 2020 was set up everything to auto debit. Um. So thank you for joining us, line listeners. As you may be aware, this is probably going to go out what today or tomorrow. Honestly, tomorrow. I put it. I probably put it out today, if only Let's because put it out today. So this is this is going to be our pre Christmas Eve podcast. Um, we are not going to do a dispatch because it's yeah. almost Christmas, and fuck it. Also, there's not just not that much news to really cover. We talked about it last week. The news had stopped. This yeah, the week, there's stopped. been local news. Like we got a big storm coming in. There was a, yes. a tragic shooting in Toronto. There's always stories like that, like the stuff that fills up the local news at six. But on the big picture stuff that we would write about. Yeah. Eh. There's nothing there's nothing really urgent, bluntly. But there are a couple things happening that are worth chatting about, I think. We were originally gonna do this as a tipsy, like a tipsy podcast, but bluntly it's like ten o'clock in the morning. It's too yeah, early. It's too early in the day to get drunk. Yeah. Um also an so hour. Let, let, let's let's do the really Canadian thing and let's start talking by talking about the weather. I don't know about you, but you and I have noticed this that because of climate change and the weird shifts in the in the jet stream, it seems now that Calgary and Toronto are polar opposites of one another so either yeah. we're minus 40 and dying and you guys are like plus two and 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 in this beautiful quasi-tropical christmas or the total opposite has happened we are like zero and you guys are receiving the ass end of some kind of nasty three-week-long blizzard um and it seems like that yet again that pattern is holding true because 
we've had this terrible cold snap for the last couple of um really just a couple of days like it's been it's been pretty brutally cold but that is all set to ease here tomorrow just as you guys head into some once in a generational big hype storm which i'm very excited about because i love storms when i woke up this morning it was plus six and rainy mm-hmm. it is now driving snow minus five feels like minus 15 that, like, that's pretty impressive that's an impressive shift i mean i've been watching all the satellite images and how the pressure shifts i i love this stuff i eat it you up. could see it coming too i, I yeah. toronto was right in them it was like a weird swirl hook thing coming yeah. through North America and Toronto's like bullseye for it. Which almost uh, puts you in like the, the, the eye of the storm in a weird way. But yeah, cool. it, it, it kind of almost looks like a, a weird um, winter hurricane that's forming over land. So you have like this warm water, this warm moisture that's feeding into this current and it's hitting against this crazy polar vortex. And it's all swirling right over on, on right over Toronto. It's fascinating. I'm like, super into it. There's like 20, 30 foot waves on the Great Lakes crazy like that doesn't happen no <laughs> um uh, yeah i mean look we're talking about where the jet stream goes now calgary and toronto will both get arctic and texas but never at the same time yes so which is crazy yeah uh, and like there there have been times in the last few years where uh it's been bitterly bit- i was telling you the other day a couple of years ago we had to actually change some of the infrastructure at our at our cottage because it was rated down to minus 30 but now it was routinely getting cold in that but we'll also have weeks in the winter where it's plus four consistently and you look at a weather map and it's a system coming right up from texas going right Mm. through ontario into quebec yeah um well i was out running errands last night and i noticed um hydro trucks staging all over the place and just put themselves in big like retail parking lots and things like that so they've put the hydro crews out there i don't think it's the snowfall people are worried about for toronto i don't even think it's the cold because it's going to get cold fast but not unusually cold it's the 100 kilometer an hour winds that we're worried about here understandably because that's pretty brutal you get winds like what kind of winds do you get? In yeah, Calgary? we get we get crazy winds. There's a reason why the south of Alberta is uh, is basically the wind belt. We have a ton of wind farms down there because uh, you get basically it's flat land right next to the mountains, right? So you just get. It's why it's why also this whole area is is I mean if it were a bit warmer we'd get tornadoes, but it's not warm enough for that usually. So do you, we do get the occasional tornado, but not not like they get in the states. Did you ever flirt with the idea of being like a, a meteorologist? I'm so oh my god yes. There's nothing I want more than to cover. Once. You want to stand in a hurricane. And I want to, I want to do the hurricane reporting. Yeah. Like maybe the line can send me down to a major, major hurricane down in Florida. I want to be like there, camera in hand. I, I, I love the weather. I'm, I'm obsessed. I actually know some guys at Global who do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm open to do, well, uh, okay. I'm open to doing that, but we would probably need a special insurance rider. We probably and, would. which is fine, but I also want to maybe I could maybe I could tag along with some of the global yes, people. You know what I mean? What I mean? Like, yeah, I would want to put you with a team of people who've done it before. I don't think I want to be like, and here at the line this week, we send Jen into a category five hurricane with a Wikipedia printout of what to do. <laughs> so if we can figure out a team that will take you and we can figure out the insurance. Yes, and I would just I would just write it like uh as a fly on the wall, like what is it like to cover hurricanes? Like I would just I would eat that shit up. Are you kidding me? I would I'm I'm into it. I love weather. I love weather. Anyway, I'm literally sitting here watching the satellite images and watching the pressure bars from Alberta, like watching what's coming into Ontario and be like, what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen? Like I'm I'm following on storm like and I do the same thing in Alberta in 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 um in a uh, summer because we've got great weather in the summer so I'm like I'm watching the 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 weather patterns and the and the the bands of rain and things like that where is it coming from you know so I I'm into it I'm I'm super into it so anyway here is it's very very cold but it is going to warm up in about a day finally so the cold is breaking and it, we're getting like this beautiful fluffy snow coming down. So it's very Christmassy. Um, also, I mean, I have a, I work from home and I have a husband who is uh, Scottish. So he doesn't even have what I consider a proper winter jacket. He's like, oh, it's cold. Time to get the 20 year old uh, leather Timberland jacket out. Like he's one of those dudes, right? And he takes care of all of the shoveling. And uh, I have not left the house in about two days. He's gone up to get the Christmas roast. Not me. My my friend, you're, you're the more you look. I think your husband and I are very similar. Yes, I, I'm trying to find a non creepy way of saying that. But like, my friends have also noted that like for many many years, I never had proper winter stuff. Like when when winter just dropped below like the threshold provided for me by my winter clothing, I just 
coped with it because I'm a Canadian. <laughs> like I didn't like it never occurred to me that if I got like a slightly different garment that I actually could just be comfortable. I was just like, no, I'm very uncomfortable right now. But this is just what happens <laughs> in Canada for several months of the year. And I'm not going to complain about it because that would be you know, very I mean, well, class, I'm the quintessential like, Canadian wife. I'm just like, this is great. This is beautiful. I'm not leaving the house. That's a man's job. You go do the man thing. My wife finally actually bought me like my, like, look, I, I shouldn't throw my mother under the bus. When I was a kid, I would have been properly dressed because my mom would have insisted. And then like, in my late thirties, my wife was like, I'm getting you a proper winter coat and a proper hat and proper gloves. I remember like the first time I wore it being outside, I'm like, this is great. <laughs> So maybe I just need to like force a proper jacket on my yeah, husband. I, I'm, I'm looking, I said to my friends, it was tongue in cheek. Obviously, I'm like, hey, have you guys tried layers? <laughs> this is incredible. Like, I put on a t shirt and then I put on a sweatshirt and then I put on my proper winter coat. I had a hat and gloves and it was like minus 40 and I was okay. I didn't know you could do that. So, anyway, okay, honestly, so like this is this is so good because my husband's winter jacket is his ski jacket. And when it gets really, really cold, like, feels like minus 40 with the wind chill he'll pull out the ski jacket he's like i got the proper winter jacket on now i'm like that's not a fucking problem that's a ski jacket that's what 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 is wrong with you does he zip them up no he didn't zip it out but he left the house he had two sweaters on and he didn't zip it up i i'm still borderline on zipping it up it gets too warm he says anyway it's fine but there there are two different kinds of people though would you rather be hot or cold Oh, see, um, it kind of depends. I don't mind the cold very much, to be honest. But I do think that, you know, uh, you know, just look at like, I'm t like women are smaller, like we're just smaller. We don't have the same capacity to deal with the cold that I think most larger men do. Right. So I, I like you, I will notice that even in a normal temperature, my toes will be cold and I'll go snuggling with my husband. He'll be like, how the fuck are your toes cold? Like, like we don't have that. Like we just physiologically, I don't think that a woman of my build has the um has quite the capacity to deal with the cold in the same way that my husband does. What idea bothers you more? Minus 40 or plus 40? I mean, I've dealt with both. Mm -hmm. I've dealt with both. Um, I think oh. that probably cold is better because you can always adapt better. Whereas, uh, you know, when I was in Abu Dhabi and it was plus 40 plus like 90% humidity, you know you can't you literally can't walk outside in that like you I, i've almost passed out several times like you just you're stuck inside in air conditioning and there's just nothing to be done see something one of my american friends will never understand because she's not just from the states she's from the south is how like she's up here for work occasionally and it'll be like minus two and we'll leave a restaurant and she'll be like Ugh! and i'm like <laughs> all right <laughs> Like this, and she's like, well, "You're not even putting your coat on." I'm like, "No, minus two feels good." Yeah, like minus for, two is nice for a couple of minutes. Like, yeah, I'll put a coat on eventually, but there's something nice about stepping into like a crisp, cold Canadian night. Yeah, and you know what? Like, you'll freeze to death eventually, but like just that for twenty minutes, seconds, it's not a big deal. Yeah, not not only it's not just that it's not a big deal; it's nice. Like, I enjoy stepping outside. Well, plus, you remember on a, the, uh, on a the, night. the the body's acclimate. Right. Like you do acclimate when I found when I was living in the Middle East, you did acclimate to like plus 50. Now, you didn't acclimate in the sense that you could go outside in plus 50 and not die. But I mean, it did mean that plus 36, even plus 40 was a manageable temperature after a while. You, your, your body does a, a, adapt to it. Same thing in the cold. Right. Like when you when you uh, live in Canada, I do think that you just you do become more tolerant of the cold after a year or two of it. I need to talk to uh, some friends of mine who are immigrants from warmer climates, India, uh, Southern mm -hmm. United States, Middle East. They say they, some of them say yes. Some of them say no. Well, plus I also think there's got to be, there's got to be a, um, like a physiological thing. Like we're white mm -hmm. people. We're super white. We are, we are 10,000 years adapted to bad it's fucking weather. Cold climates. Right. Where if you're, if you're, if you're, if your ancestors have lived in warmer climates forever, this is a harder thing to deal with. Well, this right? is why I don't like heat. I mean, like mm -hmm. my ancestors used to grow grass on their roof to keep the cold out. Like this yeah. is like when extreme heat comes, I like, I like a good 28, 29 degree summer day, minimal humidity, nice blue sky. Like that to me is perfect. When it gets into thirties and when it gets into the forties and 
it's not it's not my thing yeah and my, my husband's the same he he sort of like tops out at about 28 29 i top out at about 35 that's about where i go okay this is too hot yeah see i i, I think anything over 30 is gross and then yeah. anything over 40 is like the hell with this yeah. um anyway we're literally just rambling at this point but i figured I you know, like proper say. canadians I... like proper canadians we're just gonna chat about the weather it's christmas it's beautiful um we're gonna have some nice some nice snow some nice storms before christmas it's gonna be great i got um, storm it... chips because the storm wind chips? The, the wind is what worries me uh it's just because toronto's power grid at any given moment is like one brisk breeze away from total collapse so i got storm chips um got some soups in the fridge and yeah, I mean, the, I think it's actually hitting at a good time, though, because Christmas isn't for a few days. So even if things get weird, hopefully we'll be back online before we have two dozen yeah. guests coming over. Yeah, it's all good. Um, news wise. I got nothing. What, what, you caught, got? Well, what caught me on my attention is uh, Zelensky, president of Ukraine, spoke to the Joint uh, House of Congress. Mm hmm. Joint houses, joint house, so like Congress and the Senate. Is that how that works? Yeah. Anyway, and yeah, visited okay, the you. White House as well, met with President Visited Biden. the White House as well. And you know what? That speech, I mean, it was delivered in his fourth language. I mean, there were obviously some 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 pronunciation and and uh that's what I'm looking for. There were obviously some well, it's a little bit of language hurdle, but I mean he gave it just a baller speech. Really, really well done. Of course, he's doing it um ahead of the uh, uh, new class of uh, Congress critters coming in. Yeah. Um, so he's trying to secure American support for continued funding and and munitions. Um, so of course there's an agenda to it. I don't think he was fairly um uh, open about that fact. But uh, you know, the, Zelensky honestly gives me hope for the West because he's the only leader out there who's saying coming coming and saying like, look, this is what you people ostensibly stand for. We're fighting and dying for it. Step up, and I think he's forcing a bit of a of a of an awake, reawakening of the West's moral conscience on a lot of these issues. And it was just it was really um, inspiring to see him do that. Go to go to Congress and just basically be like, "We're fighting for our freedom and independence. All the things that you ostensibly champion, and uh, you know, just like you did, you know, it, it's it's a really actually it, it was an inspiring thing to see. I, I I think if I have hope for the West, it's in people like Zelensky. Comments. One, his English is a lot better than my Ukrainian. Yes, like he's the fact. I mean, this is a uh, something I talked about with people at the Halifax conference I was at a few months ago, which I've written about extensively now. The line. Um, I'm 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 not blind to the fact that the Ukrainians obviously chose the right people to send, but I think throughout this conflict, the Ukrainian people have been exemplary ambassadors for themselves. Mm. Um, uh, they've they've done really well, and that includes everything from showing courage uh, in in the face of of war, but I also think some of the grim stuff. And you know, here we are uh, the the day before the uh, the two days before Christmas. I don't want to get into it, but. Everything they've done from war crimes, prosecutions, to documenting uh, the treatment of prisoners of war, things like that, they get it on a, like on a really deep and profound level. They're fighting info war better than I've ever seen it fought. Mm. And Zelensky is no exception to that. In fact, I think oh. he's set a high bar. Yeah. And the other point I would make is just the one I think that you had made, uh, which is about with the uh, Republicans taking the House back. Again, with info war in mind, kind of this domination of information cycles, not just social media, but obviously a lot of that. One of the things that I think Zelensky was doing in Washington is giving Democrats and um, sane Republicans social media content to use to keep the nutters at bay. Of course. Because the next time some Republican starts going, we got problems in our country. Why are we giving the Ukrainians all these missiles? Or even worse, starts yes. like basically parroting uh, Putin propaganda mm -hmm. because we know that the far right is very much entrenched with Putin's sort of weird religious nationalist project. They've got those clips of yeah. Zelensky at Congress saying the stuff. And there was very, and there were some really, really good clips that he got in there. One was, of course, I think the top line in this was like, look, this isn't charity. This is an investment in your values and your worldview. Um, and of course, that's meant to mitigate legitimate criticisms that Ukraine is corrupt as all hell. So of course it is. Yep. Um, so that was very, very smart. Um, 
you know, and just and just tying his his struggle and his country's struggle to a sort of a broader West versus East kind of uh, uh, conflict, I think was was bright. That was smart. I'm googling something right now, so forgive my divided attention. Um, so, thus far, up until a few days ago, so this wouldn't include the latest arms shipment, which was about two billion bucks total American commitment to Ukraine in terms of direct cash support and also military equipment transfers is about $50 billion. Mm. That's a lot. Like that's mm -hmm. a big sum of money, but it also is pennies on the dollar considering that for $50 billion, the United States has militarily destroyed one of its great geostrategic rivals. Absolutely. Like, and not, and not sacrificed any of its own troops to do so. Not one dead American and the Russian Federation's military has been obliterated. Yep. In the history and of geopolitics. And Zelensky made a point of saying, we're not asking for your troops. We need your equipment. That was also smart. In the history of geopolitics, I don't know if there's ever been a better... <laughs> investment, yeah. Yeah, a better return on investment than destroying the Russian Federation's ability to wage war for $50 billion. Bargain. If, if we could spend $50 billion and completely cripple the Chinese military for generation, in those terms, we'd go, hmm. Good deal. Yeah. I, yeah like, yeah let's write that check like let's spend 50 billion dollars and buy a generation of military security on one of our major fronts we didn't mean to do it it wasn't intentional it wasn't our brilliance or wisdom but it's what we've accomplished yeah so hey like i said pennies on the dollar we're wrecking the military machine of one of our great geostrategic competitors merry christmas <laughs> So there's that note. Uh, the other one that got my attention this week was the terrible, cringeworthy Teresa Tam calls Santa Claus. This is the Twitter was all over this because, of course, it totally drew all of the uh, anti-vax people out of the uh, out of the woodwork. Um, you know, obviously, she was criticized for encouraging kids to get vaccinated. Uh, whatever. But my my point on this is just from a communications point of view, two things. One, Teresa Tam is not the best communicator at the best of times. Nobody wants to see any more of her at this point. People have associated her with the dark days of COVID. Um, bluntly, she's not a good spokesperson for anything positive or cheery just by virtue. And that's not even her fault. That's just by virtue of the role she's had to serve in the last few few years. But bluntly, she's also just not a great communicator. I mean, her 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 grasp of, or like her her um uh fluent fluency what's that? she's not great at english like you know what i mean like she's not she's not um uh she's fluent but she doesn't communicate naturally that's right that's right that's exactly right um and i know i'm real the irony of me saying this while i'm stumbling over my own words i'm like eh, you know you english you, you know you know what i'm saying here english. Right? yeah exactly um so the the irony of that is is intense uh, and uh, you know anyway of course so if your communication was to children, why are you sending this out on Twitter? That doesn't like just just from a straightforward. How many parents in the country are like, "Come on, kids, gather Come around, on kids, Let's gather play around the my Twitter Canada's account." Latest tweet. Yeah, exactly. Like that. That makes no sense. Twitter is overwhelmingly sort of a thirties now forties probably medium. That's where the demographic is, and parents are not going to like be showing their kids Teresa Tam's tweet. It, it, you know, so it was the wrong. It was very much the wrong um, uh, 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 platform to be make, tr attempting something like this. If she had tried this and like done this commercial where she's talking to to Mrs. Claus about what you need to do, blah, 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 blah. She really should have put that on like Nickelodeon or some kind of uh, CBC kids channel. You know what I mean? Like it wouldn't have been, but to put it out on Twitter made no sense. Um, she's the wrong spokesperson for it. And also part of the message on this was, Oh, when you're having your Christmas make or, or gatherings, open your windows and doors. It's like, it's fucking minus 30. No one's opening their windows and doors. Get a grip. No one's like wearing masks anymore, man. Like it's not happening. And this is the least persuasive argument and actor and platform to try and get that argument across. So just from a straight strategic communications perspective, it was terrible. And then you actually watch the video and it's the most cringeworthy thing in the world to watch it's genuinely awful so this thing got ratioed to shit and then of course this is followed by um omar alagraba transport minister yeah yeah and I, and I know i'm mispronouncing his name i'm a bad person i'm sorry Allegra, i think but i like bra sure. i like bra i'm sorry um he he now is doing this thing where he's like you know trying to 
gives Santa Claus you know, permission to fly through Canadian. Governments shouldn't do cute. Can I just say this? Like, I want this government to stop trying to be cute. I want all of like, and it's fine when the, the when the when the civil service does it. Like, okay, I've got no problem with NORAD tracking Santa. That's fine. But politicians need to stop trying to be cute. They're not funny. It doesn't work. It falls flat on its face. They're not popular enough. It's it's weird, and it just it's every every time they try to be cute, it seems to fall on its on its face here. Two replies. Okay. One, Theresa Tam's English is fine, but she does not have the confidence of a native-born speaker. And this has been an elephant in the room that we've all been too polite to really address since the beginning of the pandemic. Yes. I don't know if it really made a functional difference in her ability to do her job. Oh, I'm sure it didn't. I'm sure, I'm sure that it made no difference at all. But I think, well, I mean, let me just say this. Communication is not, not part of the job. Fair. And... I, I understand, like, you would never, I, I, I don't know who she beat out for the job. Like, I can't go. She was clearly the most qualified person. I don't know. Maybe she was. Maybe she wasn't. I, I can't speak to that. But what I can say is that I think you and I have talked about this a lot throughout the pandemic. And I know it seems a little mistier in memory now. Our public facing communication throughout the emergency was terrible. Yes. And it was at almost every and- level. And, and also at the provincial level, the federal oh, level, like, and, yes. and, and, this was not just Teresa Tan's fault. No, it wasn't. But I think she was a particularly egregious example. Yeah. And people people will immediately uh, challenge that. They'll go, well, she's she, she been replaced because she's not a native born Canadian or English isn't good. No, I don't like the idea of that either. And I understand why that idea turns people the wrong way. Yeah. But I think we should probably consider the fact that. You know, you and I talked during the pandemic about what they needed in the public health departments everywhere is someone who could listen to a Teresa Tam, listen to a, um, oh, I'm, I'm already forgetting the name of the woman in Toronto, the one Dr. DeVries or something, I don't whatever, anyway. um, who could like listen to it all and go, okay. So what you want to say to the public is this. Yeah. Like, they, there was... they, actually needed, they actually needed a communications professional to help them refine their message in a way that was palatable to ordinary people. And, and we and this is the opposite of what we need in almost every other area of government where everything is yeah. too scripted. Yeah. It's like the overwhelming majority of government is just scripted and message controlled into nonsense. Yeah. But then there's this other department in government that has no messaging strategy. And in the case yeah. of the federal level, has a woman who is not a native English speaker doing scientific jargon without even average. Or unless, unless also not totally get her off the hook. There were also times during the pandemic where she was turned out to be flat wrong. They all Masking did. being the obvious one. And she was saying things like, well, we're worried about, you know, uh, the virus getting in through the eyes. Like, yeah, like people won't wear the mask oh, correctly. Like, like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, so so she lost a lot of credibility right at the front with the mask flip flop. And I mean, mm-hmm. we wrote about that at the time. But, you know, I have no problem with her being the forward facing messaging when it comes to um, pandemic stuff. But this is just an example where this wasn't necessary. This wasn't like some urgent communication. They were there. You know, it just it, and it just the whole package from the actor you chose to portray it to the scripting like this it was cringe it was just pure fucking cringe and it was just the wrong audience there that as was well. my second point yeah actor you yeah, could have hired an actor get an actor you could have and i think throughout the pandemic like i was saying to you before we could have had better communication strategies like throughout and again this is not just aimed at at, at uh, dr tam this is like the city of toronto oh. announcements suck yeah eileen Devilla, yeah. that's her name um go, i mean the, oh god ontario's guy whose name i'm also blanking on the guy was before kieran moore um was just notoriously bad what these people are and i say this with love because i love nerds you know i, I love nerds i yes. i am i'm yes. one of your people yeah most of us aren't good communicators yep the fact that i can host a radio show and still be a space nerd makes me very unusual yes and you needed people like that in the loop. And what you would kind of get is people at a press conference, you got a freaked out population, 40 million people tuning in to find out. And what you get is, well, you know, there's, you know, the, the, the confidence bars are uh, pretty yeah. wide on this one. And, you know, it's hard to draw any conclusions, but, you know, somewhere between one and 100% of the population will be dead. 
And it's like, hmm, okay. Um, what they could have done with this ad in particular, like for whoever whoever's idea it was, the what the Canadian, you're you're bang on. The Canadian public does not want to see more of Teresa Tam. Well, unless unless Get like Ryan Reynolds to do it. No, no, exactly. Like, no, unless, of course, uh, Ebola is is has mutated and is about to, like, take over and kill us all. Teresa Tam is probably the right person for that message. Stop threatening me with a good time. Um, <laughs> like, no. you're right. You're right. If, if, if Hire Ryan. Perfect. Yes. Ryan Gosling. Ryan Gosling. William Shatner. He's yes. 80 years old. Brilliant. Get Captain Kirk good. to go and talk to cast Captain Kirk as Santa Claus talking with like Austin Matthews, and, like, and then that way, if it's if it's if it's cringe, it's self-aware, it. ironic kind of cringe. You know yes. what I mean? Like it was bad. And, it was bad. Like, you don't think you could get like Getty Lee, Doug Gilmore, and some francophone I've never heard of to do like a PSA? Yes. Like, stop it! Don't ask Teresa Tam to talk to Santa Claus. It's just. It, it, yeah and anyway I, remember, I, I don't i don't i don't have anything else really to add to this but well, like you're saying last week remember you, you made the point it was one of the only original points i i saw in any of the commentary about uh mary ing the international trade minister which is that these people are over media programmed mm -hmm. i don't know what it is about public health there you know what there there probably are other parts of the government that are also really bad no, at no, this. No, actually, no, but no. They didn't I, get thrust I, I was, into public stage. It, no, you know, I, this is also probably a consequence. And 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 transport ministers um, thing with um uh the the airspace permission airspace thing. This is actually um another example of over over media programming because you know some like community. We don't have our Christmas genius. shareables arranged yet. Yeah, exactly. And some yeah. Christmas, some some PR genius or some comms genius was like, I know, we'll get Teresa Tam to call up Mrs. Claus. It'll be brilliant. Like. That I guarantee you that that was where where the, the origin of this nonsense. This was not I, this this could not have been Teresa Tam's idea. I'm sure she was drafted into some oh, reluctantly. She did into, not look happy doing that. No, I'm sure she was drafted into some kind of like um, internal comms thing where they were like, I know to make these people look more popular, to make the liberal government look more popular, we'll do these fun little Christmas messages. Like this is an I th I honestly think this is probably another example of media over. Or, or communications professional over exposure here but like there's good communications and there's bad communications and i just honestly think this is just bad communications remember the simpsons movie the the great scene where like tom hanks is like the u.s government has exhausted its credibility so it's hired me to share some of mine yeah. like this is like ryan reynolds needs to just take over all canadian public communications yes fine like, get, cool get, get the bare naked ladies like just like you know what i mean like it's, we we have to throw in the towel on some of this stuff um do you want one serious political comment about all of this or do we not care about serious political comments oh no i want a serious political comment i mean we have been shooting the shit for like an hour here we, we might as well throw some kind of meat in the, into the stew yeah, this justifies the fact that I'm going to put the subscribe button under the link when I send this thing out. <laughs> um, singing the other day about evolutions in political messaging, mm -hmm. and um, James McLeod wrote a great piece for us a couple of weeks ago about how, you know, when books were the primary medium of communication, and and then when the telegraph was, and then when radio and TV, and now with the social media, blah blah blah. One of the things I'm thinking. Not, I'm not betting the farm on this yet, but let me put this idea out to you here. In 2015, the federal liberals decisively won the messaging and media more. They, they, were, they were way ahead of the conservatives. They were just better at getting their message out. And I think they haven't been good at adapting since. Mm -hmm. And I think Pierre Polyev might now be better at it than Justin Trudeau. I think that's right. I mean, this is also kind of goes back to a longstanding thesis that I think you and I have been playing around, and that is you know when trudeau got elected it was 2015 it was sunny ways everything was more or less looking up and the someone, obama team too as yeah, part, like, obama, so like importing the messaging importing talent. obama yeah and this was this was a stark contrast to what almost a decade of stephen harper who looked dour and serious and was out of step with the mood of the times and and justin trudeau was and then the times got shit <laughs> you know and all of a sudden Trudeau in sunny ways seems very out of step with the mood of the times. And I don't think that he has the internal substance 
to be able to make the pivot to being the serious, for lack of a better term, wartime leader. It just doesn't work. Now, nobody else seems to have that gravitas either. So what do you do? But uh, that, I think, is is where we're at. And I think it's the heart of all of this government's problems. And maybe maybe these sorts of weird Christmas messages and the reason why they feel so tone deaf is because I don't want my government doing cutesy shit anymore. Like, it just doesn't, it doesn't read. Like, it doesn't, like, are you out of touch with what we're going through right here? It just, it just reads as very weird. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would agree with that. Um, one of the things, and I think this is not even just a comment specifically on the feds. I think this is a comment on people in general, is that when you're really, really good at something, you become overinvested in it and you can even become kind of lazy in the sense that I, I I've said this before of, of Mr. Trudeau, this is a Twitter thread. My tweets auto delete now. So this is long gone, but I called it the winning move. A lot of us in life know what our winning move is. It can mm-hmm. be our, our looks, our charisma, our, our, we're funny. We're smart. Like we, we know what we're good at and we lead with it. Right. No one mm-hmm. puts their worst foot forward. Like we all put our best foot forward, but sometimes when people are really good at something, it's like every other talent they have atrophies. Mm-hmm. And then if either the times change or people just stop responding to your winning move, you're in deep shit. Yeah. And I think our federal government right now has been very, very good at communications. And I, I, was it Paul Wells who said this? Uh, I, think, I think he had a great essay a couple months ago where he talked about like seven staffer army, I think is what, is what he called it. Which is like when your entire government is focused on communications, pretty soon you'll realize that's all that's left. And but it's communications in the in the worst way because, like I said, there's good communications and there's bad communications. Well, I think it was good communications at first. It worked in 2015. I don't think it works anymore. And I think no. you can draw a pretty straight line between escalator video and Teresa Tam talking to the North Pole. It's just the problem is society has not been on that straight line. And you get a guy like Pierre Polyev who's doing different kinds of videos. I know everybody mocked his videos, right? The metrics oh, but they were worked. really good. They fucking worked. They were good communications. I mean, we'll this see. is this I is, mean, the this... voters will ultimately decide. That's but... fair. Yes. Um, but here, but here's what I would say is like like this is the difference between good communications and bad communications. That good communications by definition has to be in touch with where people are at. And be able to bridge the, the the gap between what you're trying to communicate and where people actually are. So that's why I'm saying good communications is yes, we needed some actual communications professionals in the public health offices helping them to craft messages that would connect where the, where where people were or were. There was a real lack of communications here, and um, the problem with this government isn't a lack of communication. The problem is of this government is a lack of good communication that is in touch with the people for lack of a better term and that's what's creating this vacuum that's allowing populism to just take off because everything coming out of this government just feels so weird and disjointed and out of touch with where people actually are and what their real concerns are right and when they do try to hit people where the concerns are it feels like an afterthought oh yeah we know that inflation's a problem it's but really, we're going to regulate the internet and give media companies a lot of money. That's going to be our signature shit for the next, you know, term, right? Um, but I mean, this is this is this is the problem. Isn't a lack of communications in 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 the the the, the government, even with the Mary Ng stuff. It's bad communications. It's really bad communications. I mean, I'm sorry. To, I don't mean to trash Amanda Alvaro, whom I quite like, but I've done some panels with her. Mm-hmm. But if she were a good communications professional. She would have said to Mary Ng, she would have protected her principal. She would have said to Mary Ng, shit, if 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 it gets out that you hired me your friend, that's going to look bad for you. You know what I mean? It's it's bad comms. That's that's the problem here. It's not a lack of comms, it's not over comms, it's overexposure to bad comms. There is a conversation that I, I have to be careful. Uh most of what I'm about to say, I'm carefully stepping through off the record conversations. But one, an interesting conversation I had recently was about uh, polling, but also pollsters and how certain pollsters become very good at telling clients, including political parties, what they want to hear. 
And polling is part of strategic messaging. Mm -hmm. The problem, of course, becomes that you get echo chambers. When parties have their own bespoke communication firms that exist in the private sector, when they have their own bespoke pollsters who work largely or exclusively with them, those pollsters and communication companies then coordinate because when those comms companies need a poll, they go to the pollster. We're yeah. setting up completely rival informational ecosystems. Yeah. And how, how many times over the last couple of months have I said to you, everybody needs a red team? Like what the liberals should do is go out and find the most conservative comms company they should find and throw money at it. Yeah. Meanwhile, the, lib- uh, the conservatives should be writing Amanda Alvaro gigantic checks. Yep. Because like you've got to start being strong where you're weak as opposed to just repeatedly doubling down on where you're strong. The conservatives do not need any further help winning in Red Deer. The liberals are going to do fine in in Toronto. Like, like, like you've got to start adjusting here. But one of the wild cards here, Jen, I mean, I, I don't I don't know Amanda Olvero. I have no I have no opinions on her one way or the other. But I, I will say that. We should not discount, and this is a a, a comment broadly on the industry, not on her in particular. Her interest is in cashing those checks. Oh, totally, totally. Like like this, I I I think we we should not underestimate to the extent to which governments, at all levels, not just the not just the federal, not just the liberals, have sort of been led by. I I was going to say like I was going to say something vulgar. Um, They've been led by parts of their anatomy into a into a kind of a you know what you need yeah. you need more you need more of us you need more media training you need, you more, need more you need yeah more you us, need yeah. more polls you need more focus groups you need more yeah. comms training you need more ghost written op-eds things like that i've ghost written op-eds don't worry not, not for politicians like i i would have to dis- uh, d- disclose those um there's an entire industry out there where people are making enormous sums of money and i'm not convinced they're actually providing value like I, I don't know. Like, so, like sometimes good PR, good GR, uh, good comms advice is essential, In, invaluable. That is invaluable. Yeah. But, but like I said, this I is. I think this a is, lot this... of it exists because the people who are in power have become convinced that they need it, and I'm not sure they often do. Well, so here's here's the interesting thing because I mean I, I recognize that we're sort of giving paradoxic paradoxical um, uh, critiques here, where we're saying like the government didn't have communications for the public public health i'm obviously on christmas mode for the public uh uh, health people like Teresa tam and then we're saying at the same time they're over loaded with these sorts of communications consultants types um and and this this seems like it's paradoxical but this is where i draw the distinction between good communications and bad communications they have too much bad bad comms sort of parasitic bloated uh, echo chambery uh-huh. type comms from within their own self indulgent circle. They have too much of that, and they have almost no what I would call good communications, which is people who are actually willing to challenge your priors, people who actually have a real good feel for where the mood of the general public and where it's at, people who have a really good sense of strategy. Um, like like I said, the, the 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 I go back to the Teresa Tam thing because bluntly, that's the perfect example of over overloaded bad communications. That was some internal or private comms team's bad idea, and it was poorly poorly thought out and poorly executed. That's bad comms. Uh yes, and I I mean look, one of the things I've written about a lot, I've I've described it as one of my meta theses is that our politics is a blob that has largely disconnected from our governance and it just they're orbiting each other but they're not the same thing anymore most of the comms i put into the blob of politics that is just disconnected from government so there's this whole self-sustaining industry where everybody's out to win the next polling cycle pollsters love that everybody needs the comms to win those polling cycles the comms guys loves that the politicians who are good at this stuff win so they love it, but then like you can't get a passport because yeah. none none of this money, energy, time, um, intellectual bandwidth is being focused on policy outcomes. It's being focused on the blob, sustaining the blob, winning winning those battles. So I will say this though, you know what I saw in the store yesterday? Mm-hmm. Pediatric Advil. 
Oh, okay. Three bottles. All right. I hadn't seen that in months. It's good. That's awesome. Good sign. I bought one. Now I have a bottle of pediatric Advil. And I'm not hoarding, by the way. It's the only bottle I have. I have half a Tylenol and now a full Advil. Then you're set for another month. Anyway, on that note, it looks like my Christmas roast is just coming through the door. And my children are massively excited about Grandma and Grandpa being present. So on that note, I'm probably going to uh, sign off. And we, we agree, no written dispatch. No, no. We we're, nothing, yeah. We're, yeah, whatever. We got nothing really to say. I mean, we, we basically said nothing for a solid, what, 40 minutes there? At least. It's great. You know what's interesting? What? Readership metrics are down. Oh, of course they are. Yeah. And I, I don't say that in a bad way. No, no. Everybody's everybody's tuning out. Everybody's Good got for you. shit to do. Good for you. They're Go still have high. fun. Like they're still they're still high. Yeah. But there's like from two weeks ago to last week was like a little step down this week it's a big step down yeah it's of course it is go go have go go spend some time with your families everybody i will encourage people to check out the naughty list next week though because the it's, naughty list is gonna it, we're, we're gonna come back with a with a with a ball with a bang it'll be yeah. great and then just for the logistics for everybody jen no written dispatch this weekend but i will publish this video and this podcast as quick as i can uh, we do have one surprise bonus nice list that we're going to run on christmas eve uh, I asked for five of each and we got six really good nice lists. So we're like, okay, we're, we'll keep one as a surprise bonus. It's very Christmas themed. It's specifically Christmas themed. We're going to run that this weekend. So enjoy that. Uh, next week is the naughty list. And then the week after that is holiday. Both of our kids are out of school. I'm going to go up North and make a rink on a lake. That's my plan. Sounds fantastic. And you know what? I just want to give an extra special heart out to all of our subscribers and, and um, both paid and unpaid, because honestly, uh, we're just loving our lives right now, and we just want to continue to provide you with great, interesting content that isn't crazy, but provokes you and makes you think. And um, that's really what we were put on this earth to do. So you know, you know because else? because you guys are supporting us, uh, we can we can fulfill our destinies and hopefully provide some entertainment and value to you in your lives. And I just want to say that I'm very grateful for that. And uh, Merry Christmas to you all. Happy holidays, whatever. Uh, and we love you all very much. We do love you all very much, especially the paids. We love you all, but like the paids are especially close to our heart. Uh, I will I will echo everything Jen said. Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. We've got uh, interesting plans for the a year ahead. We've been talking about some fun stuff that we'll be doing. Uh, we hope you enjoy your vacation. And you know what? I'm kicking myself, Jen, now. I actually did have something I wanted to say in the podcast. I totally forgot. Oh. It's weird to slip in one comment slip after the Merry in. Christmas. It's all right. Your nice column that's online today, mm -hmm. you need to watch more later Star Trek. Okay. I think you're does it get stuck. A little bit more, does it get more dystopian? Have you ever watched Deep Space Nine? Yeah, I did. I actually did like Deep Space Nine better than the other ones. Yeah, Deep yeah. Space Nine is the one that explicitly acknowledges that the reason Star Trek's future is so happy and utopian is because we have limitless consumables. Yeah, and when okay. humans have all the energy, food, safety, because like, like the the whole episodes where they talk about it, like you, if you're hungry, you go to a replicator. If yeah. if you're if you're sick, you go to a doctor. If you're scared, Starfleet protects you. Yeah. When you take all those things away from humans, we become nasty aliens just like Klingons, and we will kill you to survive. So, yeah, um, I think later Star Trek is more Star Wars than you gave it credit for. But I, I, and you know what? Of all the series, I did like I did like Deep Space Nine better, um, probably for that reason. Yeah. But anyway, um, but Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Okay, Cheers. everybody. So uh, we haven't decided yet if we're going to do a dispatch next week. Um, we'll see how we're feeling. And we'll see yeah, if there's like news. Is there like, it, did yes. somebody drop a nuclear bomb on someone over the holidays? Then yes, we'll then probably we will do a dispatch. Yeah, if somebody gets nuked, we will consider doing a dispatch. Um, I agree with you. I think that, Jen, I think that's the right instinct. Let's basically uh, play it by ear. And if there's news worth talking about, we'll talk about it. If there's not, we'll give people some time off. And uh, so, good luck. Good luck with the with the weather bomb, man. I got my storm chips. I got cold beer. I, I got all I'm going to need. Uh, peanut butter. And the power goes out. It's peanut butter sandwiches, chips, and beer. If things get really bad, I am expecting live updates. My generator's ready. I got firewood ready. I know. I want, I want images, man. I want like, dude, give me all the info. Well, Put it on Twitter. Hashtag on storm. I'm, I'm following it. I'm here. I'm, I'm away from Twitter. I've been ignoring it basically for weeks. Yes. Well, that's well, wise. I started about a week ago. Anyway, uh, my love to you all, uh, Jen, my love to you, to your family. Uh, have a wonderful Christmas and go watch some Deep Space Nine. Okay. 
Thanks, everybody. Merry Christmas.